Hey everybody, I'm Tim here with Justin Andrews, the blender for diesel cigars. And today, we're gonna get to barrel aging. You're watching Cigars Daily. I wanna invite you guys to get even more out of this video and all of our other videos when you watch them on CigarsDailyPlus.com. So Justin and I have been here this afternoon at the shop in the studio talking about this barrel aging. You have got way more experience in this than I do since I have zero, a big fat goose egg, and you have literally put out two cigars with the barrel aged leaves in them. How did you come up with the Whiskey Row series? Yeah, great question. And I would say I do have experience, but it's, it's just slightly more than zero. So I'm definitely not, a, <laughs> even after two projects, I'm not an expert. But that's, the, still most, that's still more than like most people, yeah, like 99% yeah, of people. Yeah, it's, so. it's, it's a blessing and a curse, these barrel projects. So uh, the original that you're smoking, that I'm smoking, the, the whiskey row, the yeah. diesel whiskey row, we aged the binder leaf of that cigar in charred Kentucky oak barrels from Kentucky from the Rabbit Hole Distillery. The cool thing about that. They're only allowed to use bourbon barrels once. So once the bourbon is extracted from the barrel, they literally chop them up, use them as firewood. Oh my God. So I was like, hey, let's get some of these down to AJ's factory. And there are whiskey with. connoisseurs passing out <laughs> in their chairs. They're going to use them as firewood? Right. right. How, now, for other other than Rabbit Hole or other than Kentucky oak barrels, how long do they normally use a barrel? Is it more than once? Uh, no. So barrels by like Kentucky bourbon law, you can only use it once. Now, I don't know what scotch regulations or anything like, like that, but I assume it's once. Every, every other state is like the laws are like no murdering, no speeding <laughs> in Kentucky. They're like, you're not going to use that that's bourbon right. barrel more than it's, one time, guys. That's, that's right. It's against the law. <laughs> the the right. bourbon society will get you. So yeah. when I discovered that... Uh, the owner and whiskey maker for Rabbit Hole is a guy by the name of Cave Zamagnon, family friend. And when he was explaining this to me, the light bulb went off and I said, I've got to get these barrels. Now, convincing AJ to let me get the barrels to his factory, that's a whole other segment. <laughs> He's that's, not that's, been big into the barrel aging previously. Never done it. Oh, wow. So barrel aging is not something that's uncommon in our industry. Uh, it's just uncommon to AJ. So getting the barrels there logistically was so much easier than convincing AJ to put his tobacco in the barrel. Uh -huh. But ultimately uh -huh. I did, and ultimately you're smoking the finished product there. And I guess if I could boil it down to its simplest point, the aging process in the barrel, the barrel finishing, takes some of that Nicaraguan pepper and that spice that we love, some of that bite out of the cigar and kind of rounds the edges, but you still have that, that soul of Nicaragua. You still have yeah. that flavor, yeah. all the characteristics, and you get a little bit of the bourbon in the aroma that just helps enhance the overall smoking experience. Okay, so that's what we're after today too. Rounding out the edges on that flavor and getting a little bit of that bourbon in there. And what I got right here is a charred bourbon barrel that was given to me by Oso Brewery, who's got a distillery now. They're doing their own distilling. And so uh, they gave me two of these, but we're gonna use this one because it's the nicer one. The other one has got like rusty <laughs> bands on and stuff. So, uh, but the one thing I want to ask you about up front is the difference between barrel aging and barrel fermenting. Yes. Because that's like, that's a critical distinction and going to play a huge role in what we're doing today. Correct. So obviously tobacco goes through several different stages in the fermentation and the aging process. The tobacco that we've provided you has already been fermented. So it's already reached to the point to where you would then start to blend the tobacco. It would start to comprise the wrapper binder filler. Okay. So what this does, if you if you think about a cedar lined humidor or an aging room with cedar walls, that is where the cigars go to finish. They go to rest. Okay. All this tobacco is going to do in this barrel is to rest. But part of that resting process, it's absorbing some of the the aroma from from the bourbon, uh, some of the angel share that wasn't quite extracted out of the bourbon, and all that does is add subtlety, nuance, some complexity, and some depths of flavor. But it's not fermenting, so you don't have to worry about the tobacco kind of starting that process over again. Right. This is just the finished product going into the barrel, getting ready to have a different uh, dimension of flavor. So, so you guys can see that. The big difference between aging and fermenting is that we're not going to be heating this up. We're not going to be removing more imperfections. We're really just going to be doing some aging for character of flavor. And what he's talking about, when he says the tobacco we're using today, you can see here, this is about, what, 100 pounds a whole leaf tobacco. Yes, 100 pounds of Habano binder leaf. Okay. So, and, and one of the cool things that we've learned, and one of the critical things to the success, was determining which tobacco leaf to put in the barrel. Right. So AJ and I tried, this was about, I would say about a 16 month process. We rolled the cigars, we put the cigars in the barrel. 
uh, they became moist, they, they absorbed too much, mm -hmm. musky wasn't right. We tried wrapper leaf. The wrapper leaf couldn't really stand up to a lot of the moisture and the humidity that we had in the barrel. And so ultimately the binder leaf, uh, a thick, sturdy, rustic binder leaf, yeah. was able to withstand that process of barrel aging. One of the key things that AJ and I both agreed on very early on, we didn't want this barrel aging process to compromise the tobacco. Mm -hmm. So it's not flavored, the cigar is not flavored, it's not infused. There's nothing that's, that's uh, added to the, to the process other than instead of aging this tobacco in a bale, we're aging it in the bourbon barrel. Okay. And so that binder leaf is what you've gotten and that ultimately is the best leaf to put in these in these barrels. Okay, so we're gonna crack into this thing and that's one of the things I'm also gonna have Justin help me with is just getting all of this situated so we can get it open. But whatever you guys inside of this, but following this video, is gonna be some time, the actual aging time, and I won't have Justin here for that. So give me an overview of once this is all like set up, what am I gonna be doing to maintain it? So the key thing that we've, and I, I can't give you all my secrets. Right, yeah, so, okay. The, the, the whiskey row part of it will be yours. A, AJ and I made a deal that uh, I won't give all our secrets away and he won't barrel age tobacco for other people. Because, you know, AJ makes a lot of cigars for a lot of people. Oh, so, yeah. So as of right now, we've both kept that end of the bargain. So we're holding each other accountable. <laughs> uh, the key thing, honestly, which I think is, 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 is pretty open, is you need as much airflow as possible. Because this is not a traditional way of, of finishing tobacco, uh, the only thing that you have to, to, to answer for is the lack of air that's circulating within the barrel. Right. So part of that, what I would do if I were in your situation, is monitoring, one, the temperature. You're trying to create an ambient temperature and an environment that's similar to what would be in Nicaragua, okay. uh, which in Phoenix, Arizona is, is a challenge. Tough. We're going to have to humidify <laughs> the inside of this barrel, so we're going to use bovidus for that. Correct. And the temperature control will be done by the inside of our building here. Right. Okay. And so once you've accomplished that, the next two things was monitoring that temperature, and then you will determine, as you're testing the tobacco, uh, a predetermined date to start to rotate the tobacco again. I would start off uh, on, on the lower end every 15-day rotation. Uh, probably by the second 15-day rotation, I'd roll a little Fuma, smoke it, and then that will give you a really good idea of how much of that bourbon and that essence this tobacco is absorbing. Okay. And the idea again, we're not you can't create a flavored cigar. Right. This is, we're not spraying it with bourbon, but this again is barrel finished. The really cool thing about that's a great ash by the way. Is that nice? Good. Look at that. The really cool thing about this, so often in our industry binder leaves are used for combustion, but they're neutral in flavor. And that's not the case for everyone, but more often than not that's that's a binder leaf's purpose. So one of the cool things by aging the binder leaf, you get a, a new dimension of flavor just beneath the wrapper. So for what AJ and I do, typically the wrapper is driving anywhere from 65 to 75 percent of the overall flavor. Well, now with that binder being aged in these bourbon barrels, there's a, there's a, a uniqueness to the, these blends, these whiskey row blends specifically, that no other product that AJ makes has. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm so excited I can hardly contain myself. So I want to crack into this thing and start taking you guys inside the process of how we're going to stack this. Justin's going to teach me how the tobacco gets stacked in here. We'll show you a little bit of that right now. And then following videos after this one are going to be sort of updates on how this is going. And I know you said it's really hard to screw up Habano binder, but at the same time, in the next sort of six months, I'll either do some really cool stuff in the barrel aging or I'll destroy 100 pounds of tobacco. But you guys will be along for the ride. Let's jump in. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, it's time to break into this barrel. Justin's gonna show us how that's done with some tools. You probably need tools. Can you do this with your bare hands? I need some tools. Okay, I need some tools. <laughs> Let me get some of this. <laughs> And this, by the way, just for everyone watching who's not a whiskey aficionado, the, there's a technical name for that, right? Bunghole. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And if I, I wish I could take you guys to where we are right now, because in this hole, it smells like glorious, glorious, glorious oh. whiskey. Yeah. So good. Absolutely. Do you want to take one more ring off yeah. to get this lid out? Oh, sweet. Right off. This is a good representation of the char level. So... All bourbon barrels are charred between, I believe it's a, it's a level one and a level five. Obviously one being the lowest, five being the highest. 
Um, each each distillery has their the way that we ferment tobacco and process tobacco. They have their own proprietary way that they char their barrels, and they've determined that based on their mash build, what type of char their bourbon basically rests the best in. So. Jim Bean may be a, a level three, Maker's Mark may be a level four, Wild Turkey may be a level five. So oh. it, all, it changes from distillery to distillery, but they all fall within that range of one to five. Um, if this was a, this is not a rabbit hole bourbon barrel, but I can tell you just by looking at this, this looks like about a level three, a okay. level three char, um, which is a good, which is a good consistent char. One of the things that rabbit hole does that is, that is very unique, and to my understanding, they're the only ones that do this, is they actually toast the barrels before they char them. So again, remember I told you they can only use the barrels once. Right. So they chop those barrels up, they use this oak wood, and they basically have an assembly line that toasts the barrels. Wow. Now by toasting before charring, this adds about an extra 15 minutes to the process. Their philosophy is by, by toasting that first, it's almost how you toast the foot of a cigar first. Uh-huh. You kind of ignite it, you get it started, those essential oils start to come out, and that cigar begins to come back to life. That's their philosophy on barrels, by toasting it before they char it. Then when you come back in with your level three, your level four char, it locks in everything that was toasted out. All the, all the, you know, the essential yeah, uh, uh, the bourbon, good stuff. the good stuff, yeah. everything that this charred Kentucky oak and what this wood is known for providing. So you toast it, you open it up, then you char it, it seals it in, and then they fill it with bourbon. Oh my gosh. All right, so the next part of this, I'm going to wear this ridiculous headlamp so that we can actually see inside the barrel some of the stacking process. And Justin's got some of the tobacco. He's going to start showing the stacking so we can get this thing filled up. All right, so I've got some some really good Nicaraguan binder leaf here in my hand. But the main thing of what I'm trying to accomplish here is it's almost a star pattern. So, so you've got the, the stem and the tip of the tobacco. And so what you want to do is to create, if I can get down in here, if you can see that, you create a pattern, and again the idea is to keep, to keep some space for airflow. So then you come here like this, so this yeah. slid here, and so then you come here, leaving a little bit of space, then we'll grab another five to six here, then you come back in with the second round, and the idea is to basically follow that pattern, but with the with the base of the tobacco, right? So you're gonna are you gonna flip now and go from opposite tip to tip? Correct. Okay. So you've got this tip here. So if you guys can see, what I just want to point out. So one side of this is the is sort of frog legged out here where the stem has already been partially removed. So you would consider that the part that would that would have attached to the plant. Correct. This is the outer tip. What he's doing now is he's switching. He had the frog legged part pointed one way, and now he's going to be putting that edge tip. So he's literally stacked them this way, and now they're going to go in the other way. The idea is you want, as you're packing this, you want the, the, the base of the barrel and the tobacco there to be as loose as possible. So again, I've got some pockets here where there's some airflow and this isn't as, as, as pretty. We'll, we'll redo this to make sure it's, you know, uh, uh, exactly the way we want, but you've got some air here. You've got some air there. And then as we start getting up and, and further up the barrel, that's when things become a little more compressed. But the idea is there's a you want to get enough airflow at the base of the barrel so the tobacco doesn't start to, to ferment and get too hot. Okay. So if the bottom is a little loose, that's completely fine. But we're going to try to follow this pattern as we continue to go up the barrel. Right. And when we actually stack these, though, we're going to be using these bunches that we got in the box today, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sweet. Let's get to it. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna get all of that in there, slam the bunghole, and uh, we're pretty much sealed up now, right? Right. 
right. just to give everybody a frame of reference here, so now we've got all of our uh, thermometer readers in here at different levels, at different heights of the tobacco, so we can make sure that it doesn't start to ferment, right? And then we've also used some, some big old 72% bovidas here because the studio is not actually humidified like the humidors are, and so we just want to make sure that it stays nice and humid in there for the leaves. Uh, and so at this point now, it's going to be about two weeks, right? Right. Two weeks. It, it, this is kind of a set it and forget it uh, thing. You have a challenge here, obviously, in Arizona. I'm good at that. I'm good at forgetting it. <laughs> so if this was in AJ's factory, uh, obviously, we, we, we don't need a Bovita uh, because the ambient temperature and the, and the humidity um, is just about ideal for this type of application. Right. So what your goal should be is, again, I, what I mentioned in the last segment is to create stability. So if you could, ideally for you, you know, temperature would be 70% humidity and 70 degrees. Right. Well, that's, a, very rarely would you achieve that all sure. the time. Sure, sure. But if you can keep the fluctuation to a minimum. So when I'm checking this daily, I would, I would hope for the temperature to be anywhere from, let's say, as low as 60 degrees, but no, no higher than 72, 73. Okay. You can get to 75, but that's when the, when the, the alarms start to go off. Yeah. From a humidity standpoint... Um, because this is more of a long-term aging, you can actually drop it a little bit lower. Okay. Because the more humidity, the more wet this tobacco is, the more it's going to absorb those those flavors. And again, we want to add the flavor without compromising the, the taste of the tobacco. Yes. So if you can keep the humidity anywhere from, I would say, uh, 60 to, to 70 tops. Okay. Anywhere in that. And, and honestly, the closer to 60 would be the better. So what we'll do is we're going to keep an eye on that. I use the 72s just because I sort of it's dry out here in the desert. But if it starts to hit above 70, I'll probably switch these out for around a 65% bovina. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I look forward to bringing you guys more of this project in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we've said it now. We're going to forget it for a little while. I'm probably going to obsessively check this out, <laughs> pull the bung out, and like smell it stuff. So uh, the big goal, though, is in a couple weeks, I want to bring you guys back, give you an update on how this tobacco is doing, uh, but not before I sit down and roll a Fuma right now and get an idea of what this tobacco is like before the whole process. you got to do it. All right. That's the fun part of the process. That's the first thing. Yeah. All right, guys, so now we've taken some of this Honduran Habano binder leaf and made a couple Fumas up front because you need a baseline to launch this right. leaf, right? We just need to get a baseline for flavor so that we know what's changing uh, in the upcoming weeks as I continue to bring you guys installments of this series. And so give me a little bit of what you're getting through with a Fuma. Part of the downside, it can be a little one-dimensional. It's one type of leaf rather than a whole blend, but give me what you first notice out of this because you're well acquainted with this tobacco. So what you want out of this tobacco from Honduras, which thankfully is what, what we're getting here, is there's a certain level of dryness and a, and a hardiness to this binder. What that does is that dryness through this barrel aging process, that barrel aging process will add a new dimension of flavor to this binder leaf. So this ideally is, is, is perfect because you're taking something that's not quite neutral in flavor, but it's not, there's not an abundance of flavor. Right. There's not a tremendous amount going on with this one leaf. It's just, it, and it's, it's not bad. I mean, it's just definitely a smooth leaf, but it doesn't have any kind of flavor profile here. Even not even a note that I would jump on and say, like, here's your notes. Ab absolutely right. It's good on the retro hell. It's good on the palate. You can feel it. it's got a nice throaty feel to it. And again, this, to, I'm excited. I'm actually really excited about this because once it goes through that barrel aging process, you will have a whole, no, I keep repeating it, but there's a whole nother level of flavor that this tobacco is suited for. It won't be overly sweet. It won't be overly spicy, but that combination of, of the dryness of this Honduran tobacco and the sweetness that you're going to get from barrel aging it creates a perfect combination. It's like savory and sweet. Everybody who watches the channel knows the sweetness is my like, that's my jam. I want a tobacco that's nice and sweet. So I'll be watching for that in the upcoming weeks and months as this continues to age. And you guys can see uh, over my shoulder here, we've got the barrel set up and the thermometer is on top of it. And it'll be like that in videos for the next, I mean, for months now, for about yeah. six months or until this stuff is like, we're ready to rock with it. Okay. Sweet, dude. Thank you so much for starting this project off. I'm going to be blowing up your phone with questions. No, no. I, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And uh, I think I'm going to have to make another trip down here to see how this how this turns out. I'm pretty, yeah. I'm pretty excited. You, you've set the bar pretty high here. So yes. all right. hopefully it, it, everything turns out as expected. Sweet. Well, all of you watching, please continue to follow on this journey with this barrel aging project that we're doing. And if you haven't done so, subscribe on our channel. But also check this 
this video out where you can get even more of it on CigarsDailyPlus.com. And thank you so much, brother. Thank you, Appreciate Tim. you, buddy. Yeah. All right, guys, this is Tim and Justin signing off for Cigars Daily. We'll see you all in the comments.